Welcome to this video about My Origins 3. I'm Paul Mayer. I'm the population geneticist at Family Tree DNA. This is the third video in a series about My Origins. The first one was an overview of the update, and the second one covered the methodology of how we select our reference populations. In this video, I'd like to cover a very common question we get, which is, why do I get population X, fill in the blank, in my results? Now, of course, there are many possible reasons. Our method, like any scientific method, can always be improved, and the accuracy is never going to be perfect. But in this video, I'd like to get you to change your perspective and consider a much more common reason for unexpected results. We've already seen in the last two videos how diverse human beings are. We've seen that our history is very complex with hundreds of thousands of years of mixing and isolation and then more mixing. And you now know that My Origins 3 has a staggering 90 reference populations, the most currently available in any major percentage test. And you've seen that your result comes with a chromosome painting. In the last video, we saw how percentages and the chromosome painting are combined into one result. We also saw how to define an ideal population. But what if populations are not ideal? What if they don't quite meet our definition? Then what? Let's perform a thought experiment. Suppose you're from Europe, okay? And your population ancestry results are influenced by between one and 2,000 years or maybe more. Genealogically, you have ancestors from everywhere in Europe. And yes, I literally mean that. A thousand years ago, which is about 33 generations, with enough mixing, you had two to the 33rd power or 8.5 billion genealogical ancestors. But the population size of Europe was only about 50 million people. That means everyone in 1000 AD who left descendants is an ancestor of everyone in Europe today or of no one. So all Europeans have essentially the same genealogical ancestors. Then why are there any genetic differences between Europeans? Shouldn't the question be, why don't I have ancestry from everywhere in Europe? The answer is because there's finite space in your genome. Most of your ancestors contributed no DNA to you at all. Your DNA is really a random sample of ancestors who tended to live nearby you or your recent ancestors. This plot should absolutely blow your mind. In red are your genealogical ancestors, in blue your genetic ones. The black dotted line shows the world population size over time. So who are those mysterious ancestors in your family tree if there were more of them than humans on Earth? Well, most of them are duplicates. Ancestors who show up in your tree more than once, you have many shared lines with those ancestors. And yes, this is a type of inbreeding, but don't worry, literally all of us have it. This is a simple consequence of having a finite number of people on Earth. To illustrate this another way, let's look at the chart that comes with our company's DNA swabbing kit. It's a genealogy of, of sorts, shaped like an onion. And you're at the center with your two parents in the first layer, your four grandparents in the second layer, and so on, all the way back to six generations back. So who are your ancestors before that? Well, by doing some simulations, we can see that beyond six generations ago, most of your ancestors contributed no DNA to you at all. Those are the red genealogical only ancestors. So you had eight and a half billion genealogical ancestors from 1000 AD. You had far fewer genetic ones, only a few thousand. And due to the randomness of Mendelian recombination, two neighboring Europeans share on average about two to 12 genetic ancestors, but this drops off exponentially with distance. On average, any two Europeans, regardless of what country they are, have about one or a little bit less than one genetic ancestor in common. Why is this? Well, they have more shared lines in close proximity. So if a Swedish person in Scandinavia has, let's say, 1,000 ties to an ancestor from 1,000 years ago who lived in Scandinavia, but only five or maybe 10 ties to an ancestor who lived in Spain, yeah, it's possible they have some Spanish DNA, but it's much, much more likely that they have almost entirely Scandinavian DNA. So more shared lines in close proximity. Here's a simulation done by the Coop Lab in UC Davis. On the horizontal axis, you see geographic space. This could be latitude in Europe, for example. 
when I run the simulation, it goes back in time, 10 generations, 15 generations back. And what it's showing you is in red, again, genealogical ancestors. And you can see how scattered they are across latitude, across Europe. And in blue are the genetic ancestors. And you can see, if I zoom in, although your ancestors are from all over Europe, your genetic ones in blue are mostly from the same place as you or your recent ancestors. So to recap here, your genetic ancestors are a random sample of your genealogical ones. They could be any of them, but there's a much higher probability that they're geographically close to you. And remember I said this all assumes there was lots of mixing. So was there? Yes. Plenty of gene flow that helped to erase population boundaries. This plot shows that on average, there were 50 genetic migrants per generation between European countries. It only takes about one migrant every generation to completely erase those boundaries. There were especially high numbers of common ancestors shared between many Eastern European populations, much due to the Slavic and Hunnic expansions. Only the countries shown in red stayed somewhat genetically distinct over the last couple of millennia, so that would be the Italian and Iberian peninsulas and Finland. Another way to show this gene flow is by conducting a principal components analysis, or PCA, of Europe. Genetically distinct populations would show up as distinct clusters in this plot, and we see this in some places, for example, Spain in the bottom left there. Instead, what we see for most people is that they tended to intermarry with their close geographic neighbors. We call this pattern isolation by distance, and it means that there is no strong population structure for most of Europe. The boundaries between groups are fuzzy and to some extent subjective. To put it simply, most people conceive of population structure like this in Europe, but in reality, it's much more like this. Or to use a different metaphor, people expect a nice pretty map like this with discrete boundaries, but I think of it more like this. So as long as we can appreciate this complex history, we can understand our results better and we can expect the unexpected. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something. And until next time, stay curious and thanks for watching.